is the Gift Planning Development video cast, doing something new. Uh, I know all you folks out there are uh, not spending enough time on Zooms, so I'm going to give you some more Zoom, and, but we're going to keep it brief and really, really relevant, I believe, in, in actionable items for you, the fundraiser. That's what we do at Gift Planning Development, help you get better results and generate more meaningful conversations with your donors. Today, we invited back, despite the first podcast, we welcome them back. Uh, in, in this society of ours, there's some words that are thrown out a lot. Hero, uh, not that you're a hero, Brad. Well, in my eyes, I eyes you are. Uh, hero, legend, uh, what else? Uh, I'm not one of those either. Expert, expert's a big one, right? <laughs> And I, I, but in this case, this gentleman here is definitely an expert on donor advice funds, Brad Caswell. Welcome back, Brad. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And Brad's company is Acadia Squam Group. Mm -hmm. Right. And Brad, we did a, a podcast a couple months ago about donor advice funds. And you and I were talking just a couple weeks ago uh, in one of my work, one of my works, one of my client initiatives that I'm doing, mm -hmm. yep. helping them with. We were I've really been encouraging the major gift officers to be more in tune, sensitive, look for cues. We talk about in plan giving a lot, look for the cues, look for the triggers, right? Around donor advised funds. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had called you and asked you some more specific questions, deeper level questions that were incredibly helpful. So I thought people would get a lot out of it. Okay. Uh, if we, if we talked about, so uh, the one thing, and, and I'll just kind of go down the list and you can sure. add in your expertise here. Okay. So the first thing I recommend to clients is simply have your finance department or gift uh, recording folks run a list of all the donor advised fund donors that we have. Right. right? And, that, and, and that's, that's really basic and very simple kind of record keeping. Uh, it's interesting how many charities don't do that or don't do it in a way that makes it useful downstream. Um, obviously, the gift is coming from an institution, a donor advised fund, not from specifically the donor. But 95% um, of the gifts that come in from donor, donor advised funds are not anonymous gifts. They are with a name of an account or a donor. And so you can follow the, the thread there of who is behind the money that's coming from a donor advised fund. And knowing that and, and applying what's known as a soft credit to that person or that family, is a very important part of thanking them for their gift, as well as being aware that they are part of this population that has assets in a donor advised fund. You remember donor advised funds, when they make a donation to the, those, the, the donors are getting a tax deduction at the time they make the gift into the donor advised fund. So these assets that are sitting in donors in donor advised funds are already committed to philanthropy. Really, you just need to nudge the donor to make the request of the DAF sponsor to issue the gift out to charity A, B, or C. And one of the things, the idea you gave me, which I never thought of, is contact uh, the top are the top three Vanguard, Fidelity, and Charles Schwab donor advice so In terms of national uh, DAFs associated with financial institutions, yes, yeah. yeah. And call them and ask them if they would run a report of their donors who have made grants to our organization. Mm -hmm. And I did that right away after you and I spoke a couple weeks, got right on the phone, started calling, and they were very, very friendly and amenable. Right. That's the right word, amenable. Um, yeah. have to do that. And, well, and, it, and yeah. it is actually a pretty straightforward task for them. All of them are very sophisticated when it comes to record keeping and, and technology systems. So it's really about three clicks for them to create that report. They may need to uh, filter it a little bit for the gifts that were anonymous, and they need to make sure they remain anonymous when they send you that list. But you can ask them for 10 years of giving to your charity, and they should be able to provide donor name, um, even address in some cases, if the donor is willing to let that information fly. And you can see that history. You can see the repeat gifts. And it does two things. One is it reinforces to you those donors that you have that have pretty good, sizable uh, assets in donor advised funds. The last NPT survey said it was almost $200,000 in the average donor advised account. 
So you're tapping into what I would call high net worth donors and committed philanthropists. Uh, and, and the second thing is it, it fills in gaps for your own, your own record keeping and make sure that you go back and do that soft credit and make sure that, uh, that you've got the record keeping going so you know who this donor base is that has, that have DAF accounts. Yep. Do you think, and it may, it may be different for every uh, community, but do you think community foundations would do that as well? Or do you think a little I, more? I actually, I actually think community foundations are more likely to support the idea because they are geographic, geographically centric, generally speaking. And so they're looking to facilitate positive missions in the community. And, and I think, you know, developing a relationship with a community foundation as a charity in their community is a pretty important thing. First of all, they're looking for grant opportunities that they can share with their donors. A lot of the large donor bases, uh, databases of DAFs um, are really more, will allow you to tell us what grants you'd like to make. And we'll be uh, happy to educate you on grants for this kind of thing and that kind of thing. But a lot of them make it uh, the responsibility of the donor to decide where to gift that money, whether there's a grant request out there. The community foundations are very good at managing grant requests in the community, and maybe they can't support it, but if some donor says, I'd really like to support this kind of issue, early childhood education in my community, what are my options? For them to know about you and what you do and how you do it is a pretty important connection to somebody who's got a, a DAF program. Right. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned uh, donors wanting to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And obviously the DAF, what would you call it? What do you call, do you call them donor advised fund organizations? What's sponsor? The we generally are referred to as sponsors, DAF sponsors. So they DAF sponsor sponsors. a donor advised fund. Yeah. Okay. So obviously the DAF sponsors have to hold up to their agreement. Right. You, in your experience, now community foundations, I would think, especially if you know somebody, like I know, Obviously, some folks from the Philadelphia area, community foundation, I could probably call them and say, hey, we get it. We just got this really large grant from one of your donors. Mm -hmm. I know they want to remain anonymous. Is there any way you could, in your next conversation with them, see if they would be open? I mean, you know me. You know how right. char charming and witty I am. Maybe, maybe <laughs> the donor would enjoy a, a conversation, right? Well, it, the, I think there's a great tactic there, and you and I talked about it recently, that um, – if you can't reach to that anonymous donor because you don't know who they are, uh, reach back into the donor advice fund that sent you that anonymous gift and thank the DAF for sending that gift. That $5,000 is really going to help our organization do this or do that. And would it be possible for you to share with me the name of the donor so I can thank them as well? Now, nine times out of 10, the DAF's going to say, no, I can't do that. At which point I wouldn't give up on the conversation. I would actually put it back on the DAF and say, I understand, I understand the rules, but would you do me a favor? Would you call the donor and thank them for me? Tell them that I called you. I'm really appreciative of having this gift. And I just wanted to pass my thanks on, even if it's through you. Now, as I worked in the DAF space myself and ran a call center, I took it as a great opportunity for me to actually call one of my donors as a DAF sponsor and say, hey, we just got a call from XYZ Charity. They were just over the top about the gift you sent. And I just wanted to call you, pass that message on, and thank you for making that gift myself. Um, and you know, that becomes a very powerful opportunity for the Donor Advised Fund to, to connect back with their donor. Because with all the technology out there today, a lot of times, these grants are flying out the door and there's not a whole lot of touch going on at the DAF level. It's sort of the grant works, it's legitimate, send it off to the charity. So for me as a call center manager at a DAF to have an opportunity to call a donor specifically, talk to them on the phone and thank them is a great, a great opportunity for me to stay in touch with my donors at the DAF. So, so you as the charity, Call your DAF, say, hey, love to talk to that donor, but if not, give them a call for me and just say thank you very much. Um, I found that very empowering as uh, a call center manager of a large charity, a DAF, to be able to say thank you for your gift. Do those, the large ones we talked about, do they have people that we would consider either fundraisers or stewardship types of people that do that, that, that reach sure. out? Well, they, they, um, 
generally they, they're broken into two or three groups. Uh, I mean, the two groups that come to mind are the ultra high net worth donors. They want to provide more handholding and custom philanthropic advice services for, and then the sort of the, the group of most other donors, which are great donors and, and great opportunities, but uh, aren't making that many grants or need that much handholding. They're very self-sufficient. Um, but uh you know, these people are, they're making good sized charitable donations to the DAF. It's not trivial stuff. So it's uh, pretty, pretty important to be able to say thank you more than just a form letter that goes out and says, here's your tax substantiation letter. <laughs> so uh, my point of asking that, besides out of curiosity, is whether gift officers should be trying to develop relationships with people at these big DAF sponsors. I would say yes. I wouldn't force it. But one of the things there are a lot of different kinds of DAFs out there, so it, it depends on the DAF. Um, but I, but I'd say there's a real value in being on their radar or know how, knowing how to be on their radar at the at the DAF sponsor. Uh, that could be the DAF comes back and says, "Look, we have a giant database, and we give everybody access to the GuideStar Candid database, and so make sure you're represented appropriately in there, and you're not buried." you know, in the last line of the searches. So make sure your, your profile in those locations is adequate. Some of them uh, may be building their own databases of grant opportunities, locals, friends of whatever, that they can put you into their database as well. Um, and, and it depends on the charity, the DAF that, that's going on there. Certainly the community foundations want to know about all of the charity that's going on in their community. So, so being connected to the DAFs is not a bad thing. Some of them are going to say, you know, we don't have time or we just do everything electronically, but I'd say um, it's worth the phone call and asking how you can be involved with, with the DAF. Great. So, yeah. And the last area is beneficiary, of course, right? Being plan giving people, we can't right. leave it out. So <laughs> we, one thing that a question I get from folks some often is if the donor donor advised fund donor does not select beneficiaries, mm -hmm. the DAF sponsor keeps whatever is in the account when the donor passes, when the that's, estate is. Yeah. That's certainly the default option that almost every DAF has is that if you pass, and we don't know what to, you haven't given us any instruction on what to do with the balance in your account, then we are going to move it into our trustees account to allow our trustees to gift the money to charities of their choosing or whatever. They still have to use the money for charitable purposes for the most part, but um, that usually is the default option, which is if we don't know what to do, we have no instruction, we're going to do X. So every DAF, virtually every DAF is asking what should we do with the money on your passing. And some options are you can pass it on to an heir and let them manage the account going forward. Sometimes uh, the option is I want to pass it on to charity X or charity X, Y, and Z, three, pass it all out. Um, and sometimes people will actually say, I look, I believe in the brand that I've invested here in the DAF sponsor, and I'm going to give it to your trustees for them to give the money out. But it's very important uh, to recognize that these funds, um, I was looking earlier today, you know, $120 million billion in assets held in donor advised funds. That's last year's numbers. Um, uh, all of that is going to go somewhere and it's going to go to charity at some point. And if a donor doesn't pass it on to family, it's going to go out to charities. Make sure you're on their list, especially if you're getting regular gifts. Um, make sure they haven't forgotten you as a charity in that mix. And most DAFs will allow for multiple or, or split distribution of the balance so it can go to charity A and charity X and charity Z in this ratio or whatever. But I would say as, as a charity, there's a reason to understand a DAF's legacy programs and how those play out so you can be more informed in your conversations with DAF account holders in how to manage legacy situations. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. Well, wow. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> That's why you're the expert. I lived it for more than a few years, yes. Yeah, now are you, do you talk about where you worked? Are you able to uh, tell people where you worked? I, I can. Uh, I am no longer associated with them, but, but I was the CEO at Vanguard Charitable for uh, 12, 10, 12 years. And uh, 
it's a, it, it was a great experience in understanding DAS uh, and appreciating a brand like Vanguard's brand. And um, I had a great time. Good people, great donors. Um, that's actually one of the fascinating things that I took away is that not only are the donors passionate about their philanthropy, but the people who work in that DAF are also passionate about philanthropy for their donors, but also they all have some personal sense of philanthropy. And that feeling and energy about doing good things in the world was, was intoxicating. It really made it a great environment. Wow, beautiful. What a great yeah. way to end it. Let's end on that. That's well, nice. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so just quick takeaways, especially for gift officers, right? Mm -hmm. Is make sure you, your internal people run the report so you knew, know who is giving from their DAF. Call at least the top three DAF sponsors. Mm -hmm. Ask them if they'll run your report. Just to back check, make sure that you've got everybody. Right. Uh, on that one, Joe, I'd actually say don't limit to top three. If, if you've received a gift from a donor advised fund, include them in that list. Okay. If you've never received a gift from Vanguard, I'm not sure it's worth making that phone call. But, um, uh, but if you've ever received a gift from a DAF, I would ask that question of them because you don't, you might not have connected the dots on the three, one, three gifts prior to the last one you saw. So, yeah. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then of course, make sure you're talking to these donors about the opportunity to make our charity a beneficiary. Right. Right. Of that donor virus fund, of course. Right. Anything else? Um, I, I think that's, uh, I think one other reason to be connected to donor advised funds is to figure out how you can help them. Um, so one quick angle on that um, is there may be something in your gift acceptance policy at a hospital, at a school or whatever that prevents you from accepting a certain kind of gift. But your local community foundation or one of these national DAFs may well be able to accept that kind of gift and pass the proceeds on to you. So it could be uh, illiquid asset gifts, it could be real estate, S corporations, could, could be any number of things or, um, you know, and, and maybe it could be annuities. Somebody's looking for an annuity and it's not something that you're going to do in your organization. Maybe the community foundation can do an annuity for you or there are other, other institutions in the DAF space that can do those things. So think about how, what, what's the reciprocal opportunity that you can help the DAF in growing their businesses would be another connection point. Great. Good yeah. bonus there. Yeah. And so uh, what, quickly, we'll do a quick commercial for you. What problems do you fix with your business, Brad? We're trying to, we're trying to help uh, two things. Trying to help um, both charities as well as donors understand the DAF world, exactly this conversation, but trying to help charities either build a DAF from scratch, uh, augment something they've already got, or understand why they should do a better partnership with DAFs rather than create their own DAFs. It's really not in their wheelhouse to expand that way. Uh, and the second thing we try to do, one of the large reasons DAFs are successful is they, they can manage large illiquid asset gifts. And so we facilitate um, gifts of real estate, hedge funds, private equities, um, art collections, things like that. So we help organizations manage those kind of gifts convert them to cash so that the charity will have the cash to manage towards their mission as opposed to a painting on the wall, which is not going to do anything to help their mission directly. So, so we do those two things, help explain and understand this DAF world, help DAFs do a better, more efficient job, as well as uh, trying to help with large illiquid asset gifts as a, another form of uh, charitable donations for charities. Right. And how can people get in touch with you? We're at uh, www.cadiasquam.com. You better spell that. www.acadiasquam, A-C-A-D-I-A-S as in Sam, Q-U-A-M, dot com. So Acadia, like Acadia Park in Maine, Squam, like Squam Lake in New Hampshire, and dot com. Of course, of course. <laughs> we all knew that. Come on. Of course, that. I knew that, yeah. Great. And it's Brad Caswell, C-A-S as in Sam, W-E-L-L. -L. That's right. Yep. Got it right. All right, cool. Brad, thank you, as always. Joe, my pleasure. Good to connect with you. Good job.